King Ashoka. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Homer Simpson. I'd love to take you all on a journey from the birth of religious tolerance through the development of liberal religion and into our secular entertainment society. But I have a short time at the podium and you have many presentations to sit through. So let me leap to what I hope will be a useful tool for presenting science in a religiously hostile context. I call it us and them. This is not my work. <laughs> this comes from a creationist comic book. First, who's us? <laughs> Broadly speaking, it's anyone who wants to effectively and accurately communicate science across a gulf of religious suspicion. Now, I'm a secular humanist who fully embraces science, but us also includes people like Tim Gay, a professor of physics and a believing and practicing Christian. It also includes Ken Miller, a professor of evolutionary biology, who is also a practicing Catholic. His book, Finding Darwin's God, explores his way to reconcile science and faith. We must never lose sight of the fact that us is a big tent. But there is an important dividing line down the middle of that tent. It separates people who are free to say exactly what they think about science and religion from those who are constrained by their professional roles. The writing says, be nice or neutral. The gesture, I'm not so sure that's nice or neutral. But we should all have sympathy for our public school science teachers. So that's us. Who's them? Well, he is, for one. <laughs> Ken Ham's Ark Encounter proves beyond any doubt that if Noah had had a hundred million dollars, steel trusses, unlimited poured concrete, a workforce of thousands, and the backing of his state. He could have built a large vessel in under two years. Whether it would float is another question. But them is not just fanatics who insist that the Bible or any scripture is the one and only truth. It's also the vast number of people who are in the mushy middle who have vague ideas about science and religion. And more to the point, THEM is an acronym, a tool for you to use. It suggests that you be truthful, humble, evidential, and memorable in talking about science to a religiously mistrustful audience. Let's unpack that. Why truthful? You cannot sugarcoat science without betraying it. For example, Theistic evolution, the belief that God used evolution as his tool to shape life, is a welcome development. But it has to fit the facts, and often it does not. Writing of hominid fossils, theistic biologist James Kidder says, the forms become more human, leading eventually to our own species some four million years later. In his infinite wisdom, God has set us on a path toward our eventual communion with him. It is a testament to his creative power and patience. OK, but look where we ended up. The human birth canal is a lousy compromise between big brains and bipedal locomotion. In the absence of modern medicine, roughly 1 in 20 women die in childbirth. Evolution doesn't care. Does God? It is dishonest to suggest that evolution reveals a divine hand at work. A syrupy view just won't stand up. Evolution has produced many wonders, but it has also produced clumsy designs, countless botches, and notable cruelties. All animals have a pair of vagus nerves that serve many functions. When mammals evolved, something silly happened between the branches that control the larynx. The right nerve runs a straight path, but the left nerve loops down under the aorta and back up again. In the giraffe, the left one travels all the way down the neck under the aorta 
and back up again, a detour of 15 feet. It is the acme of stupid design. <laughs> then there are the cruelties. I could spend all our time on this, but let me offer just one quick example. Progeria. This is a human genetic defect, one that causes a child to age rapidly, shrivel, and die before the age of 20. It's not inherited because these poor children never have a chance to reproduce. Instead, every case represents a fresh mutation. That's the truth, and it doesn't make the case for theistic evolution easy. But here's where humility comes in. Science advocates have a responsibility to declare that the findings of science are provisional and incomplete. We don't know what fresh data tomorrow will bring, and we certainly don't know the whole truth. There's room in that for religious faith. True, the findings of science about disease, earthquakes, droughts, tornadoes, and lightning strikes show no evidence of a moral or purposeful hand at work. Yet, deep down, it may be that this all makes sense somehow. Certainly no one should be required to believe that what science reveals is ultimate reality. Science itself cannot rule out an intentional universe. Later I'll share my own views on that. But first, the best way I know to communicate humility and science is through Isaac Asimov's great essay, The Relativity of Wrong. In it, he casts science as a process of gradually reducing error in our models of the world. Great example. In 1915, Einstein published his general theory of relativity. It describes gravity as a warping of space-time that bends the path of objects. Four years later, during a solar eclipse, Eddington showed that the path of starlight is indeed bent by the sun's gravity. So Newton is wrong, but so is Einstein, because neither one offers a complete description of gravity. Yet Newton's laws work just fine for nearly every human endeavor. When extremely high speeds or strong gravity is involved, we need Einstein's more accurate equations. But if you want to predict how fast an apple will fall to Earth, Newton's laws will give you a highly precise answer, especially if you take air resistance into account. On the other hand, if you want to use a GPS, you have to make use of the laws of relativity, or else fatal errors creep in. And if you want to combine gravitational laws of relativity with quantum physics, you're out of luck, because no valid theory, no validated theory unifies them. So be humble about science, but not too humble. If someone says, Science changes its mind all the time, but the truth of scripture never changes. You might want to point out a few things. Yes, science evolves. Sometimes the process is messy. There's a lot of trial and error involved, and sometimes greed and shenanigans as well. But like the stock market, science has a clear long-term trend. It produces ever more accurate, useful, and reliable models of the world. And you might want to point out that people's interpretation of scripture changes over time. Two centuries ago, most white Americans were convinced that the Bible justified slavery. Today, let's hope they see things differently. As for being evidential, I hope I've demonstrated that so far in my presentation. When talking with people who doubt your position, you have to be concrete with example after example, not just to be persuasive, but to avoid seeming arrogant. If I simply state that evolution fails to show the hand of God at work, that's one thing. If I show powerful examples to back my claim, that's quite another. And finally, be memorable. You're not going to change someone's mind in a single encounter, but you might light a long fuse that one day leads to the fireworks of epiphany. It helps to shift the context. Science versus 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. <laughs> being, being memorable means more than just presenting argument and example. People are great rationalizers. And when we have ideology or interests to defend, we usually find a way to dodge the facts. That's how come climate change denial is a thing. So it helps to change the context. Science versus religion is a false construct. It suggests that all of science is opposed to all of religion. But this guy finds that most of science is compatible with his religion. And this guy says that his religion has to conform with the findings of science. People with a purely scientific outlook can also look past mere materialism. I, for one, think that it's entirely possible that our universe had a creator. I don't believe that creator could be God for the same reasons that Epicurus outlined centuries ago, the problem of evil. But there are several creation scenarios that are entirely consistent with the world as we find it. The best known is the Sim hypothesis. Maybe our world is a simulation running on some sort of computer. And maybe it runs better when bad things happen to good people. <laughs> but the scenario that I like the best <laughs> is the circle of life conjecture. In the distant future, if we learn how to get along and spread our peaceful civilization out into the stars, even then the day will come when our universe runs out of useful energy. At that point, our descendants, recognizing that life is good, may put all their remaining energy and talent and skill into creating a baby universe capable of evolving life like us. And maybe, maybe, that's just how we got here. Who's right? Who knows? But if we're ever going to have the slightest chance of finding out, we have to move beyond us and them. Across America and much of the world, religion is in retreat. And that makes it all the more important for us to reach out to mistrustful believers. We have to persuade them that it is possible to have faith and yet to embrace the world as science reveals it. stunned silence. What have I done? I'll just mention some of my ideas that I shared with you are elaborated in a book I published in 2012 called Free God Now. I have two copies. I'd be happy to give them to the first two people who asked. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay then. Thank you much.